Let's talk about the Shikimic Acid Pathway. My focus here is to contextualize this process to human and plant biochemistry to help you see it beyond just a bunch of steps and compound names. This will likely cater to a pharmacy or chemistry major studying pharmacognosy or natural products. So if you are part of that population, this may be for you. I will keep this simple. So if you want to know more about the structures of intermediates, enzymes, or probably reactions per step, there are other excellent discussions available on YouTube and you may check those out instead. So let me start. In general, the shikimic acid pathway is the synthesis of many naturally occurring aromatic compounds. So once again, if you are studying natural products right now, plant chemistry, for example, and you've heard of words like alkaloids or some glycosides or maybe volatile oils, and you know that those compounds you're studying have benzene rings or other aromatic rings in them, a lot of them come from this process. Second, this pathway, this shikimic acid pathway occurs in plants, protists, fungi, and bacteria. And that means a lot of organisms out there do perform this. Unfortunately, animals, including us humans, cannot do this. So whatever I will say that comes out from this pathway later, chances are we can't make them on our own. And if we want them, we might need to get them from our food. But now, as I zoom out, I would now like to present to you some of the first steps in this pathway, which I will continue in a while. So here we go. And I made sure that I only projected the part of the pathway that ends in the molecule shikimic acid or shikimate. However, you should know that once we do create this later, it's still a long way from that because the significance of this pathway happens far after shikimic acid is actually formed. So zooming in, we actually have two precursors or starting materials, which are phosphoenolpyruvate, PEP, and erythrose for phosphate, E4P. Now, there may be a probability that you watch this already having studied basic or fundamental biochemistry, so you may have heard of PEP before. This molecule is actually the compound before pyruvate is eventually formed from glycolysis. And if you did study the number of carbons of those intermediates there, you would know that pyruvate and PEP have three carbons. On the other hand, erythrose is a well-known monosaccharide, particularly a tetrose or a four-carbon sugar. And furthermore, if you actually studied the PPP, the pentose phosphate pathway, the E4P, the four-phosphate version of the sugar, actually comes from that. But anyway, the reason why I needed to say, or I wanted to say, the number of carbons for both is that if you look at their product, which I know is a mouthful, deoxyarabinoheptilosonic acid phosphate, it does have the prefix hept, which means 7. Because the math is there, right? 3 plus 4 equals 7. Also, if you are studying or if you have already studied glycolysis, uh, maybe this is a potential point for confusion. Just make sure that you do not use... DHAP is the abbreviation. That's the hydroxyacetone phosphate, right? Also, if you are interested in reviewing glycolysis or PPP, I do have some old recordings from that uh, for that in my channel. So you may check it out if you wish. But anyway, let's now proceed. From DHP, we go to the hydroquinate, and then the hydroshikimate, and then shikimate. Now, as I said earlier, this is far from the end, so we want to go forward. And the next step after that is just the addition of phosphate. So shikimate is converted to shikimate phosphate. And then, going forward, shikimate phosphate is converted into the acid choresmate or choresmic acid. Actually, in other more complete or complex references, 
there are some steps in between that I skipped, but in standard textbooks, I think this format would be enough. So as I go to Chorus Mate, we have to recognize that this is a branching point for the shikimic acid pathway because you can go to two fates or two routes. First, Chorus Mate can either be converted or can first be converted to brefinate, or alternatively, Chorus Mate can be converted to another acid, which is anthranilate or anthranilic acid. Furthermore, if we have prefinate, this guy can further branch out. So it can either become phenyl pyruvate or 4 hydroxy phenyl pyruvate. At this point, you are now seeing three loose ends, right? Or three open ends. And I'm saying that because these will give us three recognizable products under the assumption you still remember some of your biochemistry. From phenylpyruvate, we will be producing phenylalanine. From 4-hydroxyphenylpyruvate, we will be producing tyrosine. And from anthranilate or anthranilic acid, we will be producing tryptophan. And now, what's common with these three? First, in general, you may recall that these three are three of the 20 standard amino acids. But let's go further. There is something common in these three amino acids, and that is the fact that they are the three well-known aromatic amino acids, right? And this should make sense because now as I go back up, we did discuss in our introduction that this pathway gives us aromatic compounds. Apparently, that includes our three aromatic amino acids. Another thing, if we contextualize this in the context of human biochemistry, you may know already that a lot of things are essential to us, meaning we need them to survive, but we can't create them actually. And for amino acids, in many cases, I think across many <laughs> books or teachers or countries, we have the mnemonic private Tim Hall. I also used this in my recording for amino acids before. And phenylalanine, which is the P here, and tryptophan, which is one of the T's here, are considered essential. So that means we humans cannot create these two. And now I ask, does that also make sense? The answer is yes, because I did say earlier that we cannot make the things that the shikimic acid makes. So that involves two of the essential amino acids. Tyrosine is actually not essential, but that is because if you do have phenylalanine, our body can convert it to tyrosine. And you know why? Because now, as I write or draw the structures below, I want to make certain points about those. So let me draw that first. So for phenylalanine, again, we call it an amino acid because it has an amino group and it has a carboxyl group, so it's a carboxylic acid. And then the R group of this guy, of course, true to its name, has a phenyl. But now if I get tyrosine or if I want to draw tyrosine, It's almost the same, except this time we have a hydroxyl group. Remember, that is the only difference. So if we think about it, hey, tyrosine is just, again, a hydroxy version of phenylalanine. And if I even go more specific, if, for example, we note that this carbon holding the CH2 is locant 1, what would be the locant of this OH below? 
four, right? One, two, three, four. And that means that we can just consider tyrosine as the 4-hydroxy version of phenylalanine. And I just wanted to say that because as a guide to people who want to memorize or who need to memorize this pathway, that should now justify why tyrosine, the 4-hydroxy version of phenylalanine, comes from the 4-hydroxy version of the precursor of phenylalanine. Right? But one more thing. In the big picture of things, the prefenate branch, which is this one, is very significant because in more detailed accounts of the shikimic acid pathway, once we have phenylalanine and tyrosine, it's just crazy how many other things can branch from these guys. And now, I want to say that those things coming out from them in general are called phenyl propanoids. And we call them like that because of their structure. These two have the phenyl group. And if you look at the carbon chain above them, how many carbons do we have? One, two, three. Propane. So phenyl, propane. Phenyl, propane. So those are the phenyl propanoids, whatever will be coming out from them. So what are those things, those phenyl propanoids that can come out from either phenylalanine or tyrosine? First, I would say some glycosides, particularly the non-sugar portions of those glycosides. Also, some volatile oils. And let's say you have already studied volatile oils. Actually, many volatile oils are terpenoids. Those are not aromatic, so they come from another pathway. But if you happen to see a volatile oil with benzene on it, there's a good chance it comes from the shikimic acid pathway. On the other hand, most tannins have benzene or aromatic, and they are therefore coming from the shikimic acid pathway, as well as flavonoids. And so I hope this will serve as a guide because, for example, you're studying these one by one. And it's not impossible that you are required to also study the biochemical you know, route that gave them, the synthesis pathway for them. So just remember, as long as many of them have benzene, then there's a very good chance that they come from the shikimic acid pathway.